Well, good morning, church. Welcome once again to our virtual uh, online service. I guess uh, you have been blessed thus far, and uh, we'll continue our online service until such time as we know that things will come back to being normal. Hopefully, it will sometime uh, early. So let's continue to pray. Amen. Well, uh, before we begin, uh, let's open in prayer, and then I'm going to get uh, uh, James and the team to lead us in a time of worship, but let's pray first of all. Father, this morning we come before thee, God. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor for this great time of God that we, as a church, could come together, Lord. Lord, even though each one of us, Lord, will be in our homes, Lord, being part of the service, it reminds us of Acts chapter 2 all over again, God. Lord, where homes were open, oh God, and Lord, bread was bo broken in each home, oh God, and they had the service in their home, oh God. And Father, that's exactly what we are experiencing now, oh God. And for which, oh God, I ask you, Lord, to release your blessing, oh God. Let your anointing come upon every home, Lord, that are part of this virtual uh, online service, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So over to James and the team to lead us in a time of worship. Let's join in along with them as they worship and we worship together with them. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to be in God's presence. And this morning we would like to invite all the church members to join with us in worship. You know, nothing can stop us from worshiping a living God. Let's read uh, one scripture verse. Let's turn our Bible to the book of Psalms, chapter 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endured to all generations. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God All oh, my life you have been faithful oh, Goodness of God. 
this life bring suffering Jesus, thank you, Father God, for this wonderful time of worship, Father God. Lord, we thank you. We bless your name in spite of this difficult time, Father God. We choose to bless your name and we praise you. We worship you, Father God. Be glorified. Be magnified, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, once again, praise the Lord. Um, uh, I guess it was great uh, worshiping together with the team. Uh, now, before we go into communion, let me make a quick announcement. Uh, don't forget, we have a Bible study. We've been doing a series of study on salvation. And, and I only hope that you were part of it. And, and don't miss it out, because Bible study is something that we should not leave aside. So I hope you're part of the Bible study. We're doing a, studies, a, a series of study on salvation. And this Wednesday, I'm going to talk to you about what happens when a believer, after having obtained salvation, goes to heaven. So don't miss it out. I'm sure it's going to be a great study. Uh, and also want to let you know that we have a uh, you know, conference prayer every night from 8 to 9 o'clock. Uh, you know, I kept announcing, and I want to announce it once again. Uh, we'd love you to be part of that prayer that we, collective, that we collectively come together and we pray together. And I believe it's going to be powerful. It's very effective. So please join in in the conference prayer. Get in touch with Praveen, and he will be able to uh, tell you how you can be part of this prayer moment. Now, in the meantime, we have a few birthdays. And so we want to pray for those celebrating their birthdays and wedding anniversary. Father, we pray, Lord, for these precious people of God celebrating their birthdays and their wedding anniversaries. Dear God, we ask you, Lord, to bless them, to cover them with your blood. Lord, that as they cross over from this year to another year, Lord, that the year ahead of God will be a year of great blessing of God. And we thank you, Master. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Well, it's communion time. Uh, this is another sacred moment uh, as part of our service where we are partaking of the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, reminding ourselves of the covenant that he made with the church almost 2,000 years ago. And what was done then still holds strong till today. So I believe in these emblems that we are about to partake of, you know, there is a release of healing and blessing as well. Because Paul says, isn't this not the cup of blessing that we partake of? So if you have, you know, your wine, and if you have your bread or a biscuit or whatever you may have, you know, I want you to take it this morning, and uh, we're going to partake of Holy Communion. Uh, this is the type of the body of Jesus Christ that was broken. You know, he took bread, he gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples and said to them, Take and eat, all of you, for this is how my body is going to be broken for you. And in like manner, he took the cup and he gave thanks again. And he said, take and drink from this, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant that I make with you. For without the shedding of this blood, there's no remission of sins. And as we partake of these emblems, we are reminding ourselves of the death of the Lord until he returns back. Bless these emblems to our bodies this morning in Jesus' name.
Well, before we go into our communion, uh, sorry, before we go into the next part of our service, uh, we're going to bring our offering to the Lord. You know, bringing our offering to the Lord, our tithes and our offering, is just simply showing to the Lord we are partnering in this ministry. And it is our obligation to bring our tithes and the offerings to the Lord. And, and I think that we should to keep this ministry going. You know, we have bills to pay. We have uh, a lot of things to be taken care of in terms of ministry. And uh, so we, we got to uh, support this ministry because at the end of the day, your involvement in this ministry makes it a blessing. And we want to thank God for those who have been faithfully giving. And uh, I pray that the Lord would bless you as you give. Now, you'll be wondering, how can I give? You have the details on the screen. Uh, you have the bank details. You can send it online. Or if you would wish to come and drop it in at the church, you're welcome to do that. But uh, do whatever you can in bringing your tithes and offering that the Lord will show favor on you and will bless you even as you're bringing your offering today and as you're putting aside what you're supposed to give to the Lord. Let me pray. Father, this morning we thank you, Lord. Lord, there are so many promises mentioned in your Bible concerning giving, O oh God. But Lord, we, we look at one promise, O oh God, where you said in Malachi in chapter 3, you said, bring in therefore all the tithes and the offering to the storehouse that there might be meat in my house, you said, O oh God. You said, O oh Lord, in doing so, God, that you will open the windows of heaven and you will pour out a blessing that there will be no room to contain it, O oh God. And Lord, we also thank you, Lord, for the next part of the promise that you gave to us in bringing our tithes and offering. You said that you will rebuke the devourer for our sake. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, whatever form or fashion the devourer is trying to come, O oh God, and to devour, you have already rebuked, O oh God, even as we brought our tithes into the house of, of God. Bless thy people today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you, Dawson, for helping out in recording behind the camera, and uh, Diksha for your help as well. And so, praise God. Um, let's go back to Matthew chapter 24. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon his word to us this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, once again, O God, that you have not left us as orphans. Lord, you have adopted us into your family. And Lord, you've given us, O God, your word. O God, had it not been for your word, what would we have done, O God? Lord, we have been totally lost. Lord, we have, been a, we have been people of God, not knowing which direction to take, O oh God. But your word is not only that what speaks to us, but also has become a road map to the kingdom of God. And to, this morning we pray that as we go into scriptures, O oh God, Lord, that scriptures will begin to speak to us through my lips, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Matthew chapter 24, I think I told you last week, you know, uh, that I want to continue to talk from this chapter. I spoke to you last, last Sunday, you know, on uh, uh, how to endure by the grace of God. You know, God gives us his grace to endure. If it was not for his grace, we cannot endure. So that was the topic last uh, Sunday. And then I, I told you that I will continue from the same chapter even today. So we are in Matthew chapter 24. Amen. If you're there, say amen. Hallelujah. Now, looking at this chapter, I want to go back to that word. You know, he that endures until the end shall be saved. Let's look at that verse. Matthew chapter 24. And I'm looking at, let me find the verse. Um, verse 13. But he that endureth until the end, the same shall be saved until the end. Now, listen to me very carefully because I want to take you somewhere today. And I want to show you where we as a church stand in a time such as this. 
So let us not be confused. Let us not be worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, what is going to happen day after tomorrow. And, you know, many people are right now at the, at the place of confusion because as they find themselves where they are right now, they don't know what is their tomorrow. My brother, my sister, there cannot be anything more clear than the Word of God. The Word of God is crystal clear. And the Word of God is showing us where we will stand today and even tomorrow. Now, looking at this verse, he that endures until the end. Now, what is the definition of this word, he that endures until the end? It simply means until the end. So hang on over there because I want to talk to you about the end. Now, let me ask you a question. Who is Jesus Christ talking to in the first place? As I quoted to you that verse, he that endures till the end, the same shall be saved. Who is Jesus Christ talking to? Now, I believe, and I'm sure you also will believe along with me, He's talking to the saints, to you and to me. He's not talking to the ones who are raptured. Now, in our mind, we have what is called the rapture, which is going to happen. And what we are assuming, I use the word assuming, what we are assuming, the church is going to be raptured at a certain point in time. Yes, I believe that, and I preach it. But when is the church going to be raptured? That's a question. And the answer to that question is in today's message. When is it going to be raptured? Now, if Jesus Christ is talking to a group of people, he says, you've got to endure until the very end which means he's talking, as I just told you, to us, the saints. Are you getting the picture? We are going to remain over here until the end. It's not my words, the Lord's word. I'm going to remain over here until the end. So it means there is a beginning and there is an ending. Now, in this entire journey of mine, until the end, the Lord is telling us, you've got to endure. Well, Pastor, can you please explain to me, what did the Lord mean by the word endure? Stay tuned. I'm going to take you over there. Now, <clears throat> let me also say to you, with all due respect to men of God who preach and teach. I guess some of them are preaching out of somebody's opinion. Now, I began to preach for some time, some time ago. I used to preach what I heard other men of God preaching. So, which means I did not really dig into scriptures and find out what the scripture has to say, whether the church is going to remain over here for the tribulation, or whether the church is going to be taken away during the time of tribulation. I had no clue, but what I used to do, I used to preach what I heard. And I realized that's a mistake. I don't preach somebody else's opinion. Because if I preach somebody else's opinion, then it becomes a private interpretation of mine. But my brother, my sister, what I'm going to do this morning, and I'm sure you're going to agree with me because I'm going to take you straight to the Word. So I want to dive into the Word, and I want to preach to you not what I heard, but what the Word has to say. Which would you like to take? What somebody said or what the word is saying? Surely what the word has to say. 
So anyway, with all due respect to men of God, you know, who will preach, and some of them preach pre-trip, some of them preach uh, post-trip, and some of them preach mid-trip, and they say the tribulation will take place, the rapture will take place, then the tribulation starts, or the tribulation will complete, and then the rapture is taking place. So we have, you know, different views spoken by different men of God. And so anyway, that's what they say, but we are going to go to the Word and see what the Word has to say. Now, I'm not claiming to be a person that I know everything. I don't know everything. I know something, but not everything. And I want you to know that the little that I know, I want to show you. And my brother, my sister, the little that I know is directly from the Word of God. Amen? So that's what I want to talk to you today. Hallelujah. So, we have a lot of misunderstanding. The scriptures, in fact, Matthew chapter 24 is misunderstood and therefore it is misquoted. We cannot quote what is misunderstood. Amen. Now, let me take you, or let me, you know, be forthright at the very onset before I tell you that the church, listen, my brother, my sister, please listen to me very carefully. What is happening today and what is going to happen in a short time from now, beginning from today, the Lord is testing the church. The Lord is sending the church through trials. The Lord is sending the church through a season of purification. And I want to thank God that He's doing it. He's not being rude or He's not being mean. As some may say, you know, how can He allow His bride to be to go into a situation like this? No, He will not do it. My brother, my sister. That is not right. That is just my personal opinion. But what I want to show you from scriptures, and listen to me, the church is not ready for the rapture today. Get that clear. In order for the church to be ready for the rapture, the church has to be tried. The church has to go through a season of purification. The church has to go through the fire. And so I'm looking at the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ that is wanting the church to make the rapture. And in order to make the rapture, the church has to be purified. Because if you think that the rapture is going to take place right now, which I, which I, I think it will take place any time, but if you are expecting the rapture to take place right now, having escaped the purification process, let me tell you something, not, less, not more than half the church will make the rapture. So are you glad to be tried and purified? Because my brother, my sister, the Lord Jesus Christ is not coming for a bride that's flirting. He's not coming for a bride that's compromising. He's not coming for a bride that has one leg in the world and one leg in the church. No, my brother, my sister, we are either this side or that side. We cannot be like a cat on the wall. We got to be tested and tried and purified in order to marry our bridegroom when the time comes. You know, we cannot have one leg here and one leg there. It does not work that way. You know, we got to be, you know, the Bible says, uh, you know, without holiness, we cannot see God. My brother, my sister, am I speaking I received this morning? I don't think so. Without holiness, we cannot see the Lord. My brother, my sister, please listen to me this morning. The word holiness is removed. We have tried to remove it even from the Bible. We are living a compromising lifestyle. We live in a lifestyle that is disgusting to the Lord. We've got to come back to the place 
of holiness, to the place of living a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Let me repeat again. We are coming to a time when the Lord is convicting the church. In fact, he has already started. There's conviction, and conviction brings repentance. But however, now listen to me, my brother, my brother and sister, there is coming a time when people will want to repent, but they will not be able to repent. Why? Because the grace of God upon the lives of people who want to repent sometime in the near future will not happen because they will not be able to come to a place of even conviction. Now let's not wait for that day. They got to repent while the time is at hand. There's coming a time when people will only be remorseful but will not repent. Okay, now I told you Matthew chapter 24. Are you, are you there? Okay, let me take you to verse 3. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 3. Listen to this verse. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, now, now this is what they said, Lord, please tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, you got to take out words from that verse and get a full revelation of what that verse actually means. So I'm taking out a word from that verse. The, the, the word from that verse is, what will be the signs of your coming and at the end of the world? Now, what is the meaning of this word, sign? Supposing if I went to somebody's house and I went to the gate and I'm about to open the gate and enter in. But I see a sign over there. And the sign mentions, beware of my dog. Now the moment I read that sign on the gate, that got my attention. And since that sign got my attention, I'm very careful. Now, this verse that I just read to you is simply trying to get your attention in my attention to certain signs that is happening today. So, my brother, my sister, what I'm trying to tell you today is if we want to know when is the end or when is Jesus Christ coming, we got to look at the signs. The signs is getting our attention and telling us the time is ripe. The return of the Lord is very soon. Because the signs explain the return of the Lord. So we're going to look at maybe a few this morning. Go to verse 6. I'm reading verse 6. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Have you heard of wars? Yes. Rumors of wars? Yes, today that's what is happening. One country threatening the other country. One country wants to have a war with the other country. And this is worldwide. This is happening worldwide. Now what Jesus Christ is saying over here, he says, when you see all these things, it's only a sign. He says, but it's not yet the end. So now, I'm beginning to believe what the, what the Scripture says, and I want you to believe the same, because that's what the Bible says. When all these things are happening, my brother, my sister, which you and I understand, it has already started to happen. Jesus Christ very clearly says, when these things happen, it's not the end. Go to verse 8. For all these are the beginning of sorrows. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, let's put our mind to those verses that I'm just reading. 
And let's begin to understand what the Lord is trying to communicate to you and to me through chapter 24 of Matthew. So he says, you'll hear wars and rumors of wars and so on and so forth. He says, but this is not the end. But my brother, my sister, even though it's not the end, the Lord also says it is the beginning of sorrows. Now, if I would have some common sense, I'm not talking about getting some deep revelation on that, just common sense to understand what that verse simply says. I'll tell you what it says. Jesus Christ is saying, when you see all these things happening, it is not the end, but you have started a journey, a beginning of sorrow. Is it clear today? We have already started a journey. Now, my brother, my sister, I, you know, I think that we have started the journey from the beginning of this year. We are feeling the heat. We are feeling the pinch of what's happening around us. And guess what? It's the beginning of sorrows. Now, if the scripture says it's the beginning of sorrows, how much more would it become when we come to the middle? Or when we come close to the end? If the beginning is so bad, I want you to think about how it's going to be in the middle and as we approach the end. So the scripture says over here, uh, it's, it's not the end, but it's the beginning. It's the beginning of sorrows, and we will have to go through it. There's no hips and abouts about it. Now listen, my brother and my sister. If, if Jesus Christ said, you know, this is the beginning of sorrow, and we are progressing, you know, we start to move in this. Now this is a continuous present tense. It will keep on occurring day after day, day after day. But, Pastor, when is the end? Good question. Go to verse 14. Verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom, very, very specifically, the Lord is stressing, He says, this gospel, not what Tom DeCoharie is preaching today, some of the gospel being preached by some people is all nonsense. Jesus Christ said, not that. He says, this gospel of the kingdom. Let me read on. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. Now get the picture very clear. It's not the end. It's the beginning of sorrow. And then he says, and this gospel shall be preached to all the nations for a witness. And then the end comes. So if I'm looking at the beginning of sorrow, and as we journey through, and then we come to the end, that's when the gospel is being preached. So my million dollar question to you is, who is preaching the gospel? Come on, church, give me an answer. I know I can't hear you because I'm speaking to the camera. But I'm sure behind the camera you can answer me. Who is preaching the gospel? When the end is coming, you know, then, sh then shall the end come. But until then, the gospel is being preached during the season of sorrow and the beginning of sorrow. And as we are progressing into this journey over here, we're coming to the end. But there is a group of people preaching the gospel. Well, pastor, I think, I thought, and the church is gone before the sorrow begins. So if the church is gone, who's preaching the gospel? Somebody has to preach the gospel. And I'm very clear, if I read that verse, 
and I can very well understand it is as crystal clear over there preaching the gospel, you know, or this gospel to be preached unto all the nations, my brother, my sister, it has to be the church. And guess what? The church is here until the very end. Verse 14. And besides, verse 18 says, he that endures till the very end shall be saved. Are you listening to me? So I'm, I'm convinced that the church is in a journey starting from the beginning of sorrow and we are moving across in this journey until we reach the end and what we are doing in the meantime from the sorrow starts until the end of the sorrow, we are preaching the gospel. And today, I want to thank God that the gospel is reaching the ends of the world at record time. Because God has provided technology. Technology is not man's idea, it's God's idea to get the gospel across. I'm standing in the church over here in Bangalore, but I want you to know I'm reaching other parts of the world. How do you like that? The gospel is being preached around the world to every nation and every tongue, every kindred, every people group will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and God will convict the hearers and whoever, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are at the, at the very beginning. We are at the threshold of one of the greatest revivals this world has ever experienced. It is about to happen. Because the gospel is being preached. Verse 13, he that endures. Endure what? My brother, my sister, it's, it's simply... It's clear. I look at all the verses over there and see what the Lord has to say, what is going to happen, and the Lord says, you've got to endure all this. Now, I, I'm quoting to you what I, what I said last Sunday. You know, as we, as we are making this journey, and as it becomes difficult and more difficult and more difficult, my brother, my sister, please listen to me. I am not walking by myself. I have the Lord walking beside me and he's holding my hand and he's taking me through because he has given me his grace to endure. So church, don't be worried. You're not going to starve to death. The Lord will take care of all our needs and he will bless us no matter what happens outside. The Lord would begin to shower his blessing upon you and me. Amen. Hallelujah. He will take care of all our needs. Yes, the time is coming where we're going to see the RFID chip come out. It's already coming out. It's been manufactured in the billions. It's just going to be a matter of time. I don't know when, maybe probably sometime this year. They're going to get the chip out in everyone's hand. And unless and until you have the chip or the mark of the beast, you cannot buy, you cannot sell. You can't do anything. You can't do any business. But I want to tell you, my brother, my sister, God will take care of you and me. Now, look at the world today, even as I'm speaking to you. People are not able to travel. There are no, there are no aircrafts, no flights, all grounded. No pilots, all jobless. You're not able, you know, a rich man... With all the money that he has, he cannot fly, even if he wants to fly. A rich man with all the money that he has, he cannot walk into a five-star and have a five-star meal in the hotel. So what is the use of having such a big bank balance and getting his money to sit in the bank and getting rusty over there? where moth devours. What is the use? 
But guess what? I'm sure you, along with me, I had my breakfast this morning. My wife is preparing lunch. Tonight I'll have dinner. Last night I had my dinner. I got food on my table. I'm wearing on a suit this morning. I have a roof over my head. I'm not able to take a flight and travel across the other part of the world to preach the gospel. I'm not able to do that. But I got good news for you. Even though I'm not able to fly, and most often when I fly, whether it's uh, you know, within the country or overseas, the only reason why I go is to preach the gospel. That's the only reason. But today, even as I'm speaking to you, I'm not able to fly. But listen, my brother, my sister, the airways is still carrying the message to the world. So as far as I'm concerned, there's no loss. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, when I study that parable and I see that parable mentioned in chapter 24, my brother, my sister, I'm not looking at the clock or the calendar at least, but I'm looking at my watch and I want you to know the time has come for the church to go. What do I mean? Matthew chapter 24. I guess you're there. Go to verse 32. We'll read till verse 34. Now learn a parable of a fig tree. This is Jesus Christ speaking. And he says, I want you to learn this parable of a fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and put it forth its leaves, you know that summer is nice. So here again, the Lord is talking about a season. You know the season and you know summer is nice. So likewise he, when you shall see all these things, know that the time is near, even at the doors. You know, when you look at all these things happening, the time is near, even at the doors. But look at verse 34. For verily I say unto you, this generation, now he says this generation, we need to figure out which generation is he referring to. The generation that will begin to see these events unfold. And that's talking to you and to me. This generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. My brother, in, in Mark chapter 11, there's another fig tree mentioned. And this fig tree, what Jesus Christ does, he walks up to this fig tree and he does not see fruit on this fig tree. Or in other words, this fig tree was not yet bearing fruit. And he used a very specific word over there. He says, even though it was not yet season for fruit, but yet he went looking for fruit and he did not find fruit. What do you think he did? He cursed that fig tree. Now, if we understand a little botany, you'll begin to, you know, understand this. Any tree that withers, it starts from top to bottom. But the scripture says, this fig tree withered from root upward. Now, I simply understand that this fig tree that the Lord cursed was the nation of Israel. Because fig tree represents the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was cursed. Why? It was not yet time for them to bear fruit. They were not fruit bearing. So therefore, that tree was cursed. Symbolically speaking, or, or figuratively speaking, it was the nation that was cursed. And 30 years after that, they refused to receive the Messiah. They refused to acknowledge the Messiah. They said, crucify him. Get rid of him. We don't need him. He is not our Messiah. Thirty years after that, the nation disappeared in 70 AD when the Roman em emperor came in, Titus, 
and plundered the nation and destroyed it and scattered the Jews into different other parts of the world. The nation was not there. So that is the cursing of the fig tree. But then in this verse that I just read, the Lord says, now you're going to see the fig tree blossom once again. So on one hand, you have the cursing of the fig tree because it was not bearing fruit. On the other hand, you have the blossoming of the fig tree once again. Or in other words, in very simple terms, the nation is coming back into existence again. Let me throw a little more light on this. In 1948, on the 15th of May, is when Israel was born again. Came into existence once again. After almost 2,000 years. 1948. So, my brother, my sister, I'm looking at from 1948 started the blossoming. Furthermore, we have the greatest aliyah that's taking place, which means people, the Jews were scattered all over the world, now are being regathered once again into the nation. Can you see the fig tree blossoming since 1948 till as on today? They're all coming back. I see the fig tree blossom. Now, when I see this happening, it's another sign of the coming of the Lord. And it's very, very quick and very soon. Now, let me count from 1948 to 2020. Can somebody tell me how many years? 72 years. So almost 72 years. See the victory blossoming. Okay? Now, 1967 to 2020 is when when Jerusalem was recaptured and being made the capital of Israel, uh, that was in 1967. So 1967 to 2020 is 53 years, which means 50 years is one jubilee. Now, get this clear. I don't think Jerusalem or Israel is going to celebrate another jubilee, which is another 50 years from now. So we are in the last jubilee. Are you getting this clear? Now, 2,000 years since Jesus Christ till today, for almost 2,000 years, we have had 40 jubilees. Now, when you look at the figure 40, it's very important. I can give you a number of 40s in the Bible, but let me tell you, the figure 40 is a new beginning or a new chapter. 39 chapters in the Old Testament and the first book of the New Testament is the 40th chapter or it's a new chapter, a new beginning. Oh, my brother, my sister, we have just crossed 50. I think we are almost stepping into a new chapter, into a new beginning. Very soon. Now, if I look at 6,000 years that the, that the earth has existed, 6,000 years, 6,000 years until today, we have had 120 jubilees. Do you know the, the figure 120 is very important? 120 when the upper room, when the Holy Ghost came down. 120 when the Temple of Solomon, the priest, when the presence of God came down. Now we have come to the 120th Jubilee where I believe the Lord is coming down once again. Now, <clears throat> I'm not setting dates. I don't do that and I don't want to do it. But, could it be possible? I use the word, could it be possible? That in 2021, that is next year, which is actually the 73rd year since 1948. So, which means we have come to the end of 70, and then we have three more years. 73rd year. Now, could it be possible that on that year, 2021, somewhere in the middle of 2021, 
will be the time in which the peace agreement will be broken. Pastor, what do you mean by this? Please listen. On the first of this month, July 1st, Jerusalem or Israel was supposed to annex Gaza. But then Benny Gans came and he said, uh, we'll keep this on hold for a little while because of the COVID. Now Benny Gans and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu are both together ruling the country. But Benjamin says, he says, no way, I want it to be done now because I have the support of America and with their support we can uh, annex uh, the uh, Gaza Strip. Now while this talk was going on, and the plan was going on, uh, on the other hand, the PLO, the, you know, the Palestinians brought out the army. And they're getting ready. Now simultaneously at the same time, we have the Iranian army. Now, now the Palestinians from the south are approaching. We have the Iranian army right up in the north, on the other side of the Golden Night in Syria, that have stationed themselves, and they want to attack Israel. So we have Iran this side, we have uh, you know, the PLO this side, you have Lebanon that will also come in, you have Jordan that will come in, you, you will have uh, you know, uh, Libya on this side, and then at the same time, you'll have the Americans that will support Israel, and you will have Russia that will support will support. Uh, you know, Iran, I'm looking at a real messy scene, real war. And at such bloodshed, people are going to cry out for peace. And at that point in time, I'm not going to give you the name of the person. We'll know that later on. At that point in time, one person comes along and he makes peace, and they sign a treaty, which is not far from now. Now, this is going to be peace. But then in the middle, according to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, it says that peace treaty will be broken. Now, what I'm trying to tell you, could it be 2021? I don't know, I'm not sure. I'm just guessing it can because it is 70 years, 70 years of Daniel prophecy and then three years after that, three, three and a half years after that is when the peace treaty is broken. So it could be around that time. Uh, I'm really not, uh, you know, pinning that to anything that I would say uh, would actually happen. If it happens, it happens. It's just coming to my mind. Because right now, we know that Israel is preparing for war. Okay, now, as I close, what is it that I was trying to communicate? I spoke to you from Matthew chapter 24. I don't know if I'd love to continue from the same chapter next week. I'm not sure unless the Lord leads me. But what I'm trying to communicate to you, now listen, my brother, my sister, in this time of pandemic, in this time of crisis, this is the beginning of sorrow. We are walking into deeper and deeper and deeper sorrow. How many of you would like to survive in that season? You'd like to exist. You would like to have the peace of God. Now I told you this and I tell you again. It's a season of purification. It's not judgment. If the Lord tarries a little more longer. I'll tell you next Sunday that there is a difference between the wrath of God and the purification of the church. We'll know a little more next Sunday. Or don't miss out next Sunday. We are, I want to thank God that we are not here for the wrath of God. But we are here for the fire process. Why? 
when we come out on the other side, we are ready for the rapture. Or do you want to escape all that? If you escape that, you're not ready for the rapture. Or if I begin to assume that I'm not going to be here for all that, then you can also assume that you may not be able to make the rapture. Okay, let me close over here. So, what was I trying to tell you in today's message? Get yourself ready. Allow yourself to go through the fire process. Allow yourself to go through the sorrows. Now, when we say sorrow, I'm not talking about we are grieving and we are mourning and we are, we are going through a season of depression and oppression. No, my brother, my sister, that's not what I'm trying to tell you. What I'm simply saying is that when there was, you know, plague after plague and attack of the attacks and darkness and ail and blood and flies and frogs, you know, that was plaguing the land of Egypt. But on this side, we had the people of God that were looking at what was happening, but nothing happened to them because God had his hand upon Goshen. In the same way, as we are making this journey to the very end, preaching the gospel, and as we are moving, the hand of God is upon the church and his hand is guiding us. His hand is protecting us. His hand is providing for us. We are not depending upon the world system. We are not, we are not concerned about the mark or no mark. My brother, my sister, that's not what we are concerned about. You know, that's the devil's game outside. He's trying all that outside. But I will never give my hand to take that mark because I have given my hand into the hands of God Almighty and God Almighty is the one that will take my hand and he will lead me through. So who's bothered about the mark of, mark of the beast or RFID or anything? My brother, my sister, I am not afraid of it and I don't want it and I'm going to te tell the devil straight up into his face, you can keep the mark for yourself. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you, Lord, today, in the glorious, and matchless, and mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, uh, this is not some doctrine that you gave me to speak, that you gave me facts. Lord, what I spoke was what you wanted me to speak today, O oh God. And Lord, I'm not, going, I'm not going to compromise in what you wanted to, me to say. I said it to God. Lord, I'm not afraid of people. I'm not afraid of anyone. I spoke the truth. And the truth, just there's one thing, sets us free of God. And Lord, today I pray for your precious people of God who sat and listened to the word of God. And I ask you, Lord, to give them the boldness, to give them the courage, and above all, O oh God, shower your grace and Lord, give them your favor, O God, that we'll be able to walk through to these moments of sorrow. Lord, not really having sorrow, but having the joy of the Lord, because in your presence, there's fullness of joy. Bless each one of us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon each one of us this morning and all the best. And amen and amen. Goodbye. God bless you. Love you. See you next Sunday. But I just want to remind you of one thing before we uh, uh, wrap up. Uh, you know, these online uh, messages comes to you directly from YouTube. Okay? So now you're, you've been watching. Now, after this is over, you know, after the time is over, it is retained in your mobile. And you've got that link. Send that link to somebody else. Let somebody else be uh, blessed. Share it with somebody else. And ask that somebody else to share it with somebody else as well. So this, in this way, we can get the word across to as many as we can. And, and besides, you can sit and go through it once again and make notes if you want to. Amen. God bless you.